Hello, my name's Ed Tipper. I'm a lecturer here at the Department of Earth Sciences in the University of Cambridge. And in this short little talk, I would like to tell you a few things about how you might study Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge. And I want to try and address, firstly, what Earth Sciences is. Secondly, how you would study Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge. Thirdly, what the entrance requirements are. And finally, what you might go on to do as a future career if you've studied Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge. So firstly, what is uh, Earth Sciences? That's the, the most important question. And really to us, it is a mixture of many of the other core sciences that exist. So it is a mixture of physics, chemistry, biology in its many different flavours, uh, maths, uh, geology is a key part of earth sciences, but earth sciences, modern earth sciences, is not just geology. Uh, it is material science, how materials uh, uh, behave within the earth, uh, the study of meteorites and things which are external to the Earth, planetary sciences and indeed other planetary systems, uh, and astronomy. And all of these things collectively, or at least parts of these things, make up what we teach and what we view as Earth sciences uh, in the 21st century. And so we consider everything from nucleosynthesis at uh, the start of the Big Bang, how elements were made right at the very beginning of our universe, all the way up to processes which shaped solar systems elsewhere within the universe, our solar system, our sun, uh, the processes which formed planets within our solar system, and of course the processes which have shaped our own planet, the Earth. So we consider things from other galaxies and other uh, uh, other planetary systems which are forming around uh, other galaxies, which is now thought to be the norm, of course, and we teach this uh, from the very beginning of our course, and we consider and research what's going on in our solar system. How did the planets form within our solar system? What materials did they form from? How did they accrete? When did they form? Uh, and, of course, what has happened to them? Uh, since since they have formed, uh, not forgetting major events like things that might have formed the moon, which is thought to have formed because of a major uh, impact which struck uh, the Earth early on in in its history. So we consider really the Earth in the broadest possible sense, uh, where it sits within our solar system, where our solar system fits within the universe, uh, uh, and uh, and so on. But of course, the key thing about our planet, it's known about a, it's known as a blue planet. One of the key things is its habitability, the fact that it can sustain life. What is it that is key about our planet the, in the way it evolved that allowed it to sustain life, that allowed it to have water at the surface of the Earth that, that makes it possible to sustain life? What is unique about our planet that, that makes that happen? What's unique about the climate history? of our planet. Something makes the temperature history of our planet rather unique. And so studying our climate both in the present day and throughout the entirety of Earth history is a very important thing. And so here we're looking at a record of climate or of temperature in degrees Celsius over the last 500 million years. This is what an Earth scientist would understand Earth's climate to look like over 500 million years of history. This is on a logarithmic scale on the x-axis. Uh, and you can see there have been significant changes in planetary climate over time. The present day is somewhere here. Uh, and this period here is about 60, 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs went extinct. And there's been a major evolution in climate over that time period. How do we know how climate has changed over that time period? What has caused climate to change over that 
time period? Is it a physical process, a chemical process, a biological process, a process which is external to the Earth in terms of the amount of radiation, incoming radiation which we receive? What's going on and how do we know? These are some of the key questions that we will ask from the very beginning uh, in our course of Earth Sciences. And of course not forgetting what's going on in the most recent part of planetary history and indeed in the present day, how we are ourselves as humans altering our atmosphere. This is a very famous curve uh, monitoring carbon dioxide compositions from the 1950s onwards uh, in the Pacific Ocean and the island of Hawaii in the Pacific Ocean all the way through to the present day looking at carbon dioxide uh, emissions increasing in uh, Earth's atmosphere, which of course has got a profound effect on climate. What's going to happen to that carbon dioxide? Where is it going? Why is it going where it is going? And how will the Earth respond to that increasing carbon dioxide? And indeed, maybe what are the engineering solutions that might help fix that problem? Are there solutions that we can take home from the Earth to try and remove carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and put it somewhere else, perhaps mimicking some of the natural phenomena that go on as part of the natural carbon cycle? The kind of questions that an Earth scientist at the cutting edge would be asking uh, at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Earth sciences is also the study of uh, earthquakes and volcanoes, two things which don't occur in isolation here uh, on the bottom left uh, here an earthquake in Nepal uh, and here on the upper right uh, a volcano which is ongoing right now uh, in uh, in Iceland and is still still erupting right now. What causes these phenomena of earthquakes and volcanoes? What are the hazards which are involved? Why do earthquakes occur at specific places on the planet? Why is the rock beneath Cambridge, not molten, uh, yet the rock beneath Iceland is molten. What's going on? What are the physical processes? What are the chemical processes that are causing these things? The kind of questions that an Earth scientist might ask. The biosphere has shaped our planet, has shaped the surface of our planet and has made our planet perhaps the unique planet that it is, certainly in the solar system and beyond. But what gave rise to the biosphere? How do we know? How can we take what we know from the present biosphere and think about how the biosphere has evolved through time? When did it evolve? What kind of environment did it evolve? Did it evolve in? And indeed, how can we use uh, uh, that environment to think about how that in turn shaped the biosphere? How has the biosphere shaped the whole surface of the planet? How has it changed the atmosphere, the composition of the hydrosphere, the kind of questions that an earth scientist might want to might want to ask and of course does ask. And of course what about earth surface processes here such as uh, a desert storm uh, in Namibia in the very arid uh, environment of, uh, of Namibia. Uh, what are the consequences of, of such earth surface processes and uh, these arid places, or indeed other major earth surface processes like this raging river that's cutting through uh, that's cutting through the Himalaya here in central Nepal. What are the consequences of all of that dirt that is present uh, in that river? Where did it come from? Where is it going to? And why does it matter? Why do we care? So that's what earth sciences is, or a taster of what earth sciences is. How might you study earth sciences at the University of Cambridge? Well, earth sciences is part of something called the Natural Sciences Tripos or the Natural Sciences Course. Uh, and so you would study earth sciences uh, hand in hand with a series of other sciences when you come to Cambridge in first year. So if you uh, if you get here, uh, uh, that's what you would do. You would study it hand in hand with other sciences. Why, why would you come here? And why would you come here not just to be an earth scientist or not just to be a physicist? Well, there's a number of reasons why you'd come to Cambridge. Of course, not least, it's, it's one of the world's leading universities for science. It has been for a long time. Uh, this is um, uh, Newton, of course. Uh, 
but it continues to be so in the present day. This is an image from the current mission uh, to Mars. This is the Perseverance mission. One of the uh, NASA scientists is a member of our department. One of the team leaders of that mission is a member of our department, actually guiding that rover across the surface of Mars, trying to understand whether the surface of Mars might have been habitable or not. So we have this long tradition of world-leading science, and that world-leading science continues right the way through to the present day. And if you come to Cambridge, you have the opportunity to be in contact with those world-leading researchers, to be taught by those uh, world-leading researchers. Um, you have a set of outstanding uh, resources in Cambridge, some of the best resources uh, in the world, and you have opportunities to participate in some of that world-leading research yourself. Some of the, the teaching that we will do is project work and you get the opportunity to participate in some of that research. And our aim as a university and our aim as a Department of Earth Sciences is to educate, to encourage the next generation of world-leading scientists. And really that's, that's one of our core uh, missions is to try and is to try and do that. So it's an exciting place to study. It's an exciting place to come, and it's a place that is full of opportunities. So the natural sciences course. If you come here to study earth sciences, it's not like many other universities. You come and you study a broad range of science. There's a single point of entry. So you would come, you would apply to a college, uh, and you would progress from first year where you would look at fundamental courses or more fundamental courses uh, and you would progressively become more specialist to a single subject in the final year. So typically in first year or absolutely in first year you must study three different subjects in addition to mathematics and that will progressively become narrower as you specialise as you move through the course uh, through to third year or through to fourth year if there is a fourth year in the course that you have chosen. So uh, why might you do that? Well it's a fascinating uh, and a really wonderful opportunity to be able to try something before you really choose and specialise. It's a big leap between school or college and university and you know to ask an 18 year old what you want to do and whether you really want to do it for four years, that's a hard thing, that's a hard choice to make. I didn't know what I wanted to do uh, at the age of 17 or 18, and so here there's a wonderful opportunity to not specialise, to keep doing different things, uh, to try and decide what you want to do, to make your mind up. Your interests are likely to change. Perhaps you would come here to be a physicist, but physics, when you get here, isn't everything that you thought it might be. Uh, or the same. Maybe you would rather uh, uh, enjoy chemistry, or maybe you would uh, take something that you've never done before, such as earth science. Most schools will not have offered earth sciences, for example, uh, and so it's a chance to discover something completely new. Earth science, material science, things that you've not done before, and you can have a go, try it. If you like it, well, you can continue. If you don't like it, well, you've become enriched and you've sort of learnt uh, a little bit about how the world works and you continue on your original path of physics or chemistry or one of the many biological subjects. But it's a fantastic opportunity to try something before you choose, before you specialise and to stay broad. So a fantastic opportunity. So try new areas of science. You can even take biological sciences even if you've not done them uh, at A level. So there's a chance to broaden yourself out. You can take earth sciences, material sciences, uh, psychology. Uh, in second year you could take something called history and philosophy of science if that's what becomes interesting to you. So you have a broad range, you have a much more diverse range of science that you could take compared to uh, the options that you have available uh, at school. So, you know, trying new areas, that's an important thing. Uh, perhaps a more important reason, though, for taking natural science as opposed to a single subject science is it's really the way modern science is done. Most of the cutting edge successful science 
in the 21st century takes place at the interface between disciplines. It's not one single subject that is making uh, all of the advances, it's the links between the different subdisciplines where the most exciting discoveries are being made. And in a sense, earth science is a perfect example of that because we are right at the interface of all of those different disciplines and that's what makes it so exciting. In my everyday life as a researcher I get to do a little bit of physics, I get to do a little bit of chemistry, I get to do a little bit of biology, I get to do some computing and some modelling and it's a superb opportunity to be flexible and to know uh, about what's going on in the other sciences and to stay up to date with them. So at first year which is also called part 1a. You take three experimental subjects uh, out of a choice of seven experimental subjects and broadly speaking those get grouped into biological or physical sciences and you could brand yourself as a biological natural scientist or you could brand yourself as a physical natural scientist or you could do both and many people, uh, many people do. And so the physical natural sciences are generally thought of as chemistry, earth sciences, though we have some biology within our course, uh, material science and physics are the sort of the four physical natural sciences. And then there are three biological courses, which are biology of cells, evolution and behaviour, or physiology of organisms. And then everyone also takes a course in mathematics and there's uh, a course in mathematics for physical natural scientists or there's a course uh, that is more adjusted to uh, to the biological courses which is called mathematical biology which deals more with statistics rather than uh, some of the things that are dealt with in mathematics for physical scientists. So you have a range of options of things that you can take. Now People who come here and who are interested in earth sciences, these would be the five most popular combinations that people might do. So you might take earth sciences with chemistry and physics or earth sciences with material science and physics or earth sciences with material science and chemistry or earth science with chemistry and biology of cells or if you're on the biological side of the natural sciences tripos you might take earth sciences with biology of cells and evolution and behavior and those would be the five most popular choices now of course being an earth scientist i've put earth sciences as the first choice in each case and of course many people uh, that that won't be the case they will come to cambridge to do physics or to do biology or to do chemistry and you might be taking earth sciences as as your third option as a as a way of trying something new, something that you've not done before. It's a superb opportunity to be able to do that. And you might dip into the course for a year uh, and then return to chemistry, uh, or you might change your mind and end up liking earth science and sticking with us uh, for the duration. So you have an option. Uh, in the second year, or also referred to as part 1b, the number of options broadens out. There are more options. Now, some courses offer two options. So, for example, chemistry offers two options, chemistry A and chemistry B. Earth sciences offers two options, earth sciences A and earth sciences B. Uh, there's material science. Physics offers two courses, physics A and physics B. Uh, there are a host of biological subjects from animal biology, bio biochemistry and molecular biology, biology of disease cell and developmental biology, ecology, evolution and conservation, evolution and animal diversity, experimental psychology, neurobiology, pharmacology, physiology and plant and microbial sciences. Uh, there is also mathematics uh, which people typically will combine with physics uh, but you don't have to combine it with physics, you can, you can do it uh, with earth sciences if you want to, people do very successfully, uh, and there's history and philosophy of science if, uh, if that takes your fancy at that particular stage and you want to know a little bit about how the whole scientific method has evolved uh, over history. 
So at part 1b, you will usually choose a set of complementary subjects. So whereas at part 1a, you may choose to take a set of complementary subjects, or you may choose to take a, a set of subjects that are trying new things, perhaps combining biology of cells, earth sciences and physics. At part 1b, you will usually begin to specialise in perhaps taking both physics courses and mathematics, or perhaps taking earth sciences A with both physics courses, or perhaps taking both earth science courses with one other subject, perhaps history and philosophy of science, for example, or both earth sciences and material science. But you tend to start to specialise in on one particular area as you start to know what you enjoy, what stimulates you the most. You'll have had a year of doing stuff by this stage and you will start to know which courses are going to suit you, are going to suit you better. And in third and fourth year, some courses offer fourth years, so uh, astrophysics, chemistry, earth science, materials, physics, history and philosophy of science and biogeochemistry all offer fourth years, referred to as, as part three. But in the third and fourth years, you tend to specialise and choose one subject out of the, the 17 options. Um, within each subject, there is then uh, a large number of options within each subject. So within earth science, we have a large number of different things that you can do at part two, and an even greater number of things that you can do in part three or fourth year. So although you're specializing in uh, into a specific subject, in a sense, there's still a very broad range of stuff that you, that you will cover. So how do we do it? What's the teaching method? Well, there are sort of several strands to the teaching method uh, in Cambridge, uh, some of which are the same for all subjects and some of which are a little bit different, depending on which subject you take. The key thing that is the same between all subjects are lectures. In first year, there are between nine to 12 hours of lectures a week. So each subject has got three hours of lecture lectures per week. You're taking three experimental sciences and maths, so that's 12 hours of lecture, uh, 12 hours of lecture a week uh, in first year. As you move up through the course, that, that generally reduces and you become more independent uh, in your method of learning. You will read more, you will spend more time in the library, you will spend more time in the laboratory uh, 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 working in a more independent uh, way. So lectures are key, every subject has got lectures. Uh, practicals are also key, science is experimental after all. Typically uh, practicals take place in afternoons, though again it depends on the subject that you take and the style of practical material that you cover again depends on the subject you take and the year in which you are in. So with earth sciences at fourth year you will typically be in the lab like these pictures show, uh, whereas in first year and second year you might be uh, looking down uh, a microscope for example, or you might be working with materials that have been recovered from uh, other parts of the year but, uh, of the world by other researchers, such as ice cores that we've got being collected on Antarctica here by our department, or from cruise ships, and you might be looking at marine cores that have been recovered from cruise ships uh, 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 in various parts of the oceans, trying to understand uh, what's going on with those. But practical material, practical work is absolutely key, and in some respects is even more important uh, than lectures. So practicals are a major uh, component. And first year, for example, in earth sciences, for every lecture, every one hour lecture there's a one hour practical where you actually get the opportunity to be hands-on with the material and to talk to perhaps the lecturer or a demonstrator uh, about what's about any questions that you might have about the course. Something that's absolutely unique in Cambridge are the tutorial system referred to here as uh, supervisions. We call them supervisions but these are really specialist courses where usually in groups of between two and four. They're usually organised by one of the Cambridge colleges 
and uh, you will have one supervision per week for each of your science subjects. So three science experimental subjects in first year plus maths, which means that you're going to have four hours of supervisions per week and your supervisor will set you some work every week. You will hand that work in and you will get feedback. You might even get a mark on that work every single week. So you will be doing work for each of your four subjects every week and you will then get to talk that through in the supervision. And those supervisions will be tailored to your needs. So no two supervisions are ever the same. Uh, you have the opportunity to ask questions. You can request a topic. Uh, you might have got stuck on a given piece of supervision work and want to talk that through more clearly or want a derivation of an equation or want to look at a specimen or want to know how something works or have something clarified from a lecture. But this is your opportunity to really tailor the learning to your specific needs in a small group. And these are usually in groups of two or three people. And so you get to know the people well you get to know your supervisor well and you, you build up a relationship over the year so that you sort of understand how each other's minds begin begins to work. So supervisions are really a unique part of the Cambridge uh, system. Uh, another way of learning that we work on is not that we work with is not only practicals, but we work with computer models here. This is a little bit gimmicky, but this is just showing uh, what seismic waves might do to the surface of the earth in fact what they do to the surface of the earth so it's just an animation that's been created on supercomputers but computing and modeling is a key part of what we do not only in this geophysical example that i've given here but also in geochemistry in the biological uh, aspects of what we do uh, and indeed in all aspects of what we do modeling computing and mathematics is absolutely fundamental to, to everything uh, that we do. Now, the one thing that's absolutely unique about our course compared to almost all of the other natural sciences courses here in Cambridge is that we do field work. And we take you on field work from places as far and wide as the northwest of Scotland. This particular picture is from the Isle of Arran, where we take you on our first year field trip uh, by the time you're in third year, we take you to Greece. And by the time you're in fourth year, we take you to Spain. So we take you far and wide uh, across the world. And really, this is a superb opportunity to get together and uh, learn as a group and get to know the course staff uh, very well. You'll spend a week away with the course staff and you'll be able to ask questions uh, and really discuss things in a lot of detail. And Quite often people say that they learn uh, as much in the fieldwork as they do throughout a whole year of learning uh, in lectures and in the laboratory. So learning in the field for earth sciences is an absolutely key way of doing it. And you even get the opportunity to organise your own fieldwork if you want to uh, by the time you're in third year. You can uh, choose somewhere to go and go and do uh, some independent field work by the time you're in third year. So here are uh, four recent uh, third years who are looking happy having completed their independent field work that was part of their coursework uh, for third year. Uh, and what are some of the questions that we ask in the field? Well, we think about uh, large scale things, so things that what we call outcrop scale and why things might have happened. So in this case, these are very large scale folds in these rocks from uh, Cornwall, which have been caused by a major tectonic event, a, a plate collision. Uh, and so we look at things at outcrop scale to try and understand what's going on at, at outcrop scale or tens to hundreds of meters scale, all the way down to the micro scale in the field looking at looking at rocks which are of course our archive of how the earth works uh, with a hand lens and we do this in the field we do this in the laboratory uh, now project work is a key part of the course especially in third year and fourth year and very often 
for, for many people, it's the highlight of the course. It's where they get to be independent. You become an accomplished researcher by yourself. You will get to take part in the research that's going on in one of the research groups in the department. You will get to devise a project of your own. And in fourth year, it's almost an opportunity to sort of see whether you might like the kind of thing that you would do in a PhD. It's like a taster really, for a, a PhD. So study at university is pretty different from school or college. It's, it, it's, very, it, it's much more independent. It's harder. Obviously, the level gets harder. That's nothing to be frightened of. That's really something to be excited about. It's fast-paced here in Cambridge, and there's much more emphasis on learning for yourself and having the discipline, the curiosity, uh, and a work ethic to get on with stuff by yourself and we guide you through that and help you out when you are when you when you get into difficulty and ultimately where you're going to end up in your final year is you will be at the right level to be understanding the recent research scientific literature and what you'll find is that questions are much more open-ended and that there's not necessarily a right answer there's probably a spectrum of different answers. There are probably wrong answers, but you're going to need to develop your own understanding to try and figure out what the limitations are on that range of knowledge uh, and that range of possibilities or what the uncertainty is on something. And so there's much more choice. There are far more options and it's much more independent uh, compared to what you'd be, what you will have seen at, at school. So what are we looking for? What are the course requirements? Well, we need a, a strong interest in science and an ability to think scientifically and a strong academic academic record to date, strong academic references, good GCSE or equivalent grades. And really you need three science or math subjects to A-level. You can uh, apply with two science or math subjects to A-level, but your subject options are more limited. You won't be able to have the full uh, range of, of choices at first year and at second year. Uh, maths at A-level or equivalent to A-level is essential for physical sciences and is desirable for biological subjects. Many biological entrants will have maths. It's a, it's a very standard thing now. Further maths at AS or A level is very helpful for physical sciences uh, indeed. Uh, and of course, if you're not doing A levels, if you're doing the International Baccalaureate or if you're doing hires, uh, then uh, then that's fine too. That all gets standardized and that's that's completely, that's that's normal. We, we're used to handling that, but it's, so it's A level or equivalent is, is what we're after. And what might you do after You've got a degree in natural sciences or a degree in earth sciences from Cambridge. Well, what will you have learned? You will have you'll be able to problem solve. You'll be able to think critically and independently. You'll be able to develop practical skills, both outside and field work and in the laboratory and computing skills. You'll know how to make detailed observations and analyze those observations. Uh, and work with many different types of data. You'll be a really expert and broad, uh, diverse data handling person is what you'll be. You'll be able to come up with logical conclusions from a set of seemingly confusing and very diverse range of observations, biological, physical, chemical uh, observations. And of course, you'll be able to communicate all of that, both in a mathematical form, in a written form and uh, and in an oral form in terms of talks. And uh, and you'll be given uh, all of those skill sets. And what might you go on to do with that skill set? Well, around 50 percent of people graduating from natural sciences stay in science, usually going on to do a research degree, so a master's degree or a PhD, depending on your subject. But many go on to do entirely different things and the degree is just viewed as being as uh, as, as a really thorough training to be able to go on to do anything that you put your mind to really. So people might go into the civil service is a very common thing or insurance or education, marketing, science communication, even theatre and the performing arts are some of the things that people have gone into recently 
from our degree. So it really is a stepping stone to anything that you might want to do. But our degree, it will fill you with confidence. It will fill you with employability. You will have a range of skills, a broad skill set, and you will be sharp and you will be employable and able to do whatever you want to do. So I hope the talk was of some use. Uh, I hope it gives you a little introduction and answers some questions about what earth sciences is, how we teach earth sciences here in Cambridge, uh, what the entrance requirements are for natural sciences and what you might do after natural sciences or after you've got an earth sciences degree.